Now that we discussed the Constitutional Convention and the uh, basic uh, Federalist, Anti-Federalist debate precedents, we're going to talk about the actual ratification of these, or proposal actually, formation and, and then uh, ratification of these Bill of Rights and then what they are uh, and how we can kind of see some of them today and how they developed. Um, we're going to go into more detail on some of the specific court cases and things like that uh, later on in the course, but I'll give you a general idea kind of how these rights play out. Because a lot of times in the past I've had students like, you know, read or learn these rights, but it has no real application uh, or understanding. However, um, sometimes when I describe how they actually play out and how we see them, it helps them understand. So um, that's what I try to do. So we'll start first with the actual Bill of Rights and the, the reason for it. Uh, I briefly covered it um, in the previous video uh, as a part of the ratification debate, uh, but I want to add a couple details uh, that might help understand how it was actually made. So the Bill of Rights, um, these were amendments added um, in an arrangement where Federalists essentially had agreed to, or at least realized uh, the significance of, applying some changes to the Constitution in order to appease and satisfy some of the other states uh, that had larger anti-federalist populations. So states like Massachusetts, um, New York, and others are gonna be, have larger portions of anti-federalists, and they're going to uh, provide a lot more hesitancy or resistance and then hesitate a bit more uh, on passing the amendment. Um, most of them wanted to maintain the union for the most part, certainly the, the 12 at the convention did. They wanted to maintain the union, so even though they disagreed, they realized that this constitution was formed, and uh, while they, in the first couple months they just outright opposed ratification, uh, they're going to shift uh, their attitudes from um, you have to have amendments for us to ratify this to one more of, okay, we'll ratify it, but then we have to make these amendments immediately afterwards. So the shift goes from uh, amendments before, we won't ratify, or to, in order to preserve the union, ratify, then add amendments. Uh, and a large, that movement was uh, largely begun after the uh, Massachusetts State Assembly sort of uh, put that opinion forward when they ratified. So in Massachusetts, I think it's called the Massachusetts Compromise. Massachusetts Compromise. Uh, it was led by some of the more famous Revolutionary War uh, heroes and figures like Samuel Adams, uh, as well as uh, John Hancock. Um, but not just them, but those are some notable names. Uh, they're the ones that basically got the delegates in the uh, Massachusetts Assembly to agree uh, to ratify, but with this uh, uh, stipulation stating that they proposed some amendments and changes and they wanted those addressed immediately uh, in the new Congress. So uh, they're going to kind of set the precedent, set the precedent uh, for uh, amendments after ratification. And they were, I believe, were they the, I think they were the sixth to ratify. Fifth or sixth, I think they're the sixth though. Uh, and afterwards, uh, the next few states after them are also going to ratify with the same conditions. So they're going to uh, propose um, that they will ratify, but they want some uh, amendments afterwards, uh, immediately afterwards. And they're going to propose their own, or at least a, an idea of what changes they want. Propose ideas slash amendments. Um, and then, of course, that's going to be uh, followed uh, by uh, four to five other states as well. So when they do actually ratify, um, it immediately becomes a task of the Congress to look at the uh, body of works uh, of previous um, institutions uh, and, and law and documents re regarding law and government, as well as the actual complaints uh, or ideas of these uh, more anti-federalist uh, suggestions. So the person that's going to do that, and I mentioned that in the previous video, uh, is James Madison is going to be um, the one who really puts together a composite list um, he's going to be, he drafts these uh, bill of rights. It wasn't called that, though, at the time. We, we would just call that, you know, the, the amendments. He actually is going to put together 20 initially. Terrible. Uh, that's going to be condensed, though. And he doesn't just do this randomly or arbitrarily. He uh, 
looks to several sources to do this. So obviously we know that he um, has a, a, an adequate understanding of, or an expert understanding of governmental history and theory. Um, he's well acquainted with Montesquieu and a lot of the Enlightenment ideals. But he goes back historically and pulls uh, some specific examples from um, English law that we've already talked about in this class. So for example, when he's drafting these specific rights they want to add um, uh, in the, uh, with these amendments, he's going to go back and look at a couple documents, uh, most notably the Magna Carta, which we've talked about here, an important one. From here he's going to pull specifically uh, the idea for the right to petition. So basically that's the idea that you can uh, formally have citizens come together and, and sign a list of grievances or complaints and submit that to the government. And they have to at least consider it. Uh, that's, that's not made illegal. Uh, that can't be stopped or punished. <clears throat> and, it, and it has to be uh, formalized. Uh, as well as uh, a right to, uh, to trial. So no, um, of course, no arbitrary punishing by uh, a, a an executive uh, or, or legislative branch member just because uh, they don't like you or disagree with you or they want to silence you or stop you. They've got to have uh, an actual public trial process for that. All right, and uh, they're also going to pull from the English Bill of Rights. <clears throat> uh, they're going to get quartering from here too, but ah, well, no, that one's not as significant, although it's going to be in there. Uh, the ones that are significant that are uh, talked about and part of a lot of Supreme Court decisions, uh, on the other hand, are going to be uh, like the uh, right uh, to arms. He's going to pull that from the uh, English Bill of Rights because they specifically had that when uh, King James II was attempting to disarm Protestants. They're going to, and actually it even says, I believe it's worded specifically for Protestants in the English Bill of Rights. Nonetheless, that idea of uh, guaranteeing that citizens can uh, use uh, or possess weapons uh, is going to be a fundamental constitutional right. Now that's going to change interpretation. We'll get to that, so don't get all get your hair raised already. Uh, we'll talk about how that's developed over time um, in the, with the Second Amendment and, and through a court histories. But just know that's the the idea uh, from which this amendment was um, derived, or the the document for which it was derived. All right, so the uh, right to arms, and um, as well as prevent against cruel and unusual punishment. And keep in mind, uh, back in the early modern era, which is back when 1688, when this is written, towards the end of it anyway, uh, that's when uh, you still had some carryovers of those old medieval tortures and uh, awful uh, trial processes where they, where they would, uh, well, like I said, torture people and, and, and exert these uh, uh, ridiculous punishments uh, that we would not approve of today. Uh, that's also gonna be an issue of, um, of controversy in the Eighth Amendment, we'll talk about that when we get to it. All right, <clears throat> and then lastly, he's going to pull from the, uh, uh, he's going to read and uh, include some of the uh, common propositions from uh, state suggestions. So these states that would uh, offer these, uh, prop pr propose these ideas or amendments when they ratify, saying, hey, we want these issues addressed, uh, immediately. He's going to read those and consider them, uh, and he's going to include uh, ones, especially ones that were common amongst many states. Um, and a lot of those had to deal with, of course, uh, uh, judicial is judiciary issues um, and, and some individual freedoms and state right protections. All right. And then uh, he's also going to put a couple of his own um, and his own that are not included. Uh, a couple of them are uh, off the top of my head. I believe he included the freedom of press. And he also includes, oh, what's the other one here? What is freedom of press. Oh, the right to a trial by jury. So those are going to be uh, just a basic set that he's going to pull from past documents, ideas from these other states, and then he's going to add a couple of his own. And there's going to be 20 total. And I know you're like, wait, I thought there was only 10 or 12 that he proposed. Uh, that's because Congress is going to change them uh, when it's proposed to them. So he's going to bring these 20 amendments uh, and uh, offer them up to Congress. And the House is going to look at them, and the Senate is going to look at them, and they're going to make their changes, and they're going to look at them together and make the changes, and that's how we get the uh, original print. So if you're wondering how the number went down, um, the House of Representatives is going to form a committee. House committee. 
So that's basically where they, they select uh, members from the House to, to uh, get together and, and form a committee and, and hammer out exactly what details they want to change or not. And uh, House and Senate committees are common. We'll get to that when we talk to the legislative branch. But uh, there's a lot of little tasks and things they have to look at. So you can't just expect all members to go out and learn this stuff. What they do generally is they uh, establish committees uh, of, you know, put together from various parties. We really have two now, but for the most part, but uh, they'll, they'll make a committee and then they'll, they'll look at the issue, whatever it is, and consult the experts and read it themselves and make changes and, and additions uh, uh, or, or eliminations themselves. So the House Committee is going to look at it and they're going to cut it from 20 uh, to 17. They're not going to so much eliminate things as much as they're going to just condense them, uh, things that are, are common or they're going to put them all into one. Uh, amendment. So like, for example, we'll look at for um, like amendments five and six, you're going to see that they protect many things. Um, so those were, I don't know the specific things that every committee condensed, but those were almost certainly uh, part of the 20 that were, were condensed down into one amendment, even though it's multiple rights being protected. Uh, Senate committee is again going to do the same thing, and they're going to take it down to, um, I believe the ones that take it down to, 10, uh, to 12 committee, if I can spell, Senate committee. They're going to form their own committee when they receive from the House, uh, and then they're going to cut it down and condense it even further uh, from 17 to 12 total amendments. Uh, and they're going to add two, I don't know if it was the House and the Senate that did this, but they're going to add specifically a couple things that Madison didn't include, uh, notably uh, freedom of speech is going to be one inclusion. I know there's another one too. I'm just trying to remember what it was. They added the uh, freedom of speech. What was the other one they added? I can't remember what the other one was. Uh, but I know they added the specific freedom of speech in there. Um, regardless, it doesn't really matter because we're going to talk about what actually got passed anyway. So uh, they do that and then they form a joint House uh, Senate committee and they're going to uh, hammer out the final uh, or final revisions. And then those are going to be passed by two thirds majority uh, in both the House and the Senate, and then they're passed on to the state assemblies, the state legislatures. So uh, these uh, state uh, groups, delegates, three quarters of the states have to approve it for uh, to to ratify uh, these amendments. So the way that it goes from twelve to ten is simply because a couple of the states don't ratify all of them. Um, most states ratified. In fact, maybe all of them, but I know most states for sure ratified tw uh, 2 through 12. That's what the first 10 are. Um, however, the first and second amendments didn't have all states ratify them. Uh, and also, it was originally 9 out of 13 were required for the three quarters, but at this point, even just a couple years after um, the, the U.S. Constitution was uh, uh, drafted and, and ratified, there, there's already new states being added, like Kentucky and others uh, to the west uh, and up there in the northeast. So now the number's different. Now if you have nine, that's not 75%. It's gotta be like, you know, 12 or 11 or 13, depending on how many states are in existence at the time. So I believe the issue was the first amendment got 10 states, but they needed 12, or maybe they needed 11. It wasn't enough. And the second amendment only got six. They weren't even actually close. Uh, the first amendment does get um, ratified later though, in um, what year was it? It was 27th amendment, it was 1982, I think. Something like that. That's the one that says Congress can't give themselves a pay raise until the next uh, session of, of, of Congress. Anyways, so um, after this, the uh, states states ratify um, amendments two to twelve, and this is what we know, of course, as the Bill of Rights, and they are going to actually add it to the end of the Constitution rather than including in the Constitution. I think Madison wanted to put them into the Constitution, like change the Constitution, but they wanted to keep it as it was and then add the amendments afterwards. I think that's probably easier anyway, and that's what they do. So if you read the Constitution, it's unchanged, uh, but then you get to the amendments at the end of it, starting the Bill of Rights and going on, and you can read all the changes that they've made uh, over the years. So that's how we got it. Um, now we're gonna talk about specifically uh, which rights those amendments guarantee and what that means because you could just read the, the the amendments themselves and it probably wouldn't help most of you out especially high school students as far as understanding what they are i want to warn you though as we go through this list of 10 
Some amendments are going to take longer to cover than others. Uh, I think the first one is probably going to be the longest. So if it takes me a few minutes to describe this one completely, you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to sit through nine more of these. They're not all going to be that long. Uh, like three, for example, is going to be just me mentioning it because it doesn't really apply to any Supreme Court decisions or changes uh, in uh, U.S. history. So first one is probably the one you probably most commonly heard, uh, and that's going to be the uh, right that uh, guarantees several rights. So First Amendment. That's going to state several things. So it, um, number one is going to prevent, uh, prevents uh, the government from establishing a, an official religion. So there's, no, there's not going to be an, an Anglican church or any other form of that or a Catholic church, whatever, where you have to be this religion and you have to adhere to these views. That's not going to exist here. Um, so that's a prevention. There's also going to be some uh, rights that are provided too. Uh, that's going to also guarantee your and mine, all of us, our freedoms, such as freedom of uh, speech. Well, I should, I should go in order, at least the order I remember. Um, they say you can't ban or uh, make an official religion and you can practice whichever religion uh, you want. So freedom of religion, so that's religious toleration right there. Uh, freedom of speech, we're going to talk about this one. Uh, freedom of the press, so they can actually, you know, criticize the government and say things that might be uh, potentially hurtful or controversial. Um, and there are going to be some limitations which we'll talk about. Um, so when we talk about the speech limitations, they also apply to the press because that's kind of the same thing. Whether you're speaking it or you're writing it, uh, that they're going to interpret that as speech. So uh, religion, uh, speech, press, uh, petition, which I mentioned before from the uh, English Bill of Rights, that's your right to uh, submit complaints and grievances to the uh, government, and they uh, can't punish you for those, uh, and they're not supposed to ignore them either. They're supposed to formally uh, address them and, and consider them. Uh, and then the uh, right to assembly. So this is your right, as it's interpreted, a right to protest, uh, at least peacefully. If you're disturbing the peace or causing violence or inciting violence, then it's not going to be protected. But if you're peacefully protesting and assembling, that is not illegal. Uh, the government can't break you up just because you're doing that. It does complicate things, though, when you're uh, potentially damaging um, or blocking private property, uh, or you are blocking the, the interactions or commerce of private citizens. But it certainly protects your right to protest at and around public or, or you know, state, that state, local, federal, whatever uh, institutions or grounds. Um, it, it's a little more hazy. Like you can't just go march into the middle of a factory to protest because uh, that's private property. This is talking about public protest on public property uh, for the most part. All right. So that's a little bit of elaboration. We're going to talk more about these two. They're kind of the same thing again, whether you're speaking it or you're writing it. Uh, it's very similar. Uh, these are pretty clear cut. You know, um, you can complain to the government. Uh, you can peacefully protest on public property, um, so long as you're not damaging things, inciting violence, or, or blocking a, a commercial activity, private commercial activity, uh, any practical religion you want. Speech though is a little complicated because that is not as simple as it sounds. Doesn't mean you can just say anything or write anything. Uh, that does not, so don't just think you can go and say whatever you want and you're protected by this, you are not actually. Um, most of these refer to what the government can or cannot um, prosecute you for, uh, as, as like a criminal case essentially. Um, it doesn't, however, protect you uh, in all commercial grounds. So uh, if you're, you work for a private company and they want to fire you or, or, or whatever, not hire you because of some stuff you said in the past, uh, they, they have the right to do that. Um, however, the government can't punish you, you know, for saying things unless they uh, violate the list we're going to go over here. Uh, that would be your right to uh, speech, specifically political speech, so you can have political opinions uh, as long as they're not doing a few things which we'll talk about here. Uh, that's generally protected. So this, uh, and here's what I mean uh, when I talk about the Supreme Court interpreting law, it's not clear all the situations this applies to. So what you have is when people say or write or do things that some people are upset with, they might become arrested, they might uh, impose criminal or civil charges on them. We'll get over what criminal and civil are, uh, civil are too. Um, nobody knows exactly if their arresting of that person or indicting them is uh, constitutional or not. So if somebody feels like it isn't, like let's say I said, um, let's say I said, uh, um, 
F the president, blah, blah, blah. And they said all this bad stuff about the president. And maybe they even said, uh, we should, uh, somebody needs to do something. Uh, uh, this government needs to be uh, overthrown or, or, or whatever. That could be interpreted as threatening the president, perhaps. It could be interpreted as inciting a revolution. Uh, it's gonna come down to what the um, uh, jury and or judges, uh, justices decide as to whether, how I'm using that speech and whether it applies to this. All right, so again, it's not clear on everything you say if it's gonna be protected or not. Uh, that's what we have courts for. They're supposed to, of course, look at what you said, look at the context of the situation, and then look at the Constitution to see if that's actually protected or not. So what we usually base that on is previous trials. So once they made a decision on something and they said this type of speech is not okay because of these reasons, uh, courts later on generally looked to that as the uh, standard. Uh, and they can't overturn that. They can, you know, times can change and, and they can overturn those. But for the most part, they use those as like a marker, like, oh, this is the interpretation, so we're gonna go based on that. So, as time has progressed, lots of issues have popped up regarding speech, especially uh, uh, commercially, private speech. But for the most part, from the 20th to the 21st century, that's if I could count, there we go. Um, there have been quite a few elaborations on which kind of speech is protected. So here's some examples. Um, they have protected a lot of political speech. So your political opinions for the most part are protected uh, across the board for the most part. Um, they have provided some uh, protections for commercial speech, but here's some examples you might not know about. Um, they have considered uh, the use of money as freedom of speech uh, or, or expression, I guess you could say. Um, so that allows people to donate to political campaigns. So you can't bribe people saying, hey, Joe Biden, or hey, uh, Donald Trump, here's money um, to you, to your bank account, your personal account. Uh, they can't do that. But I could donate to their campaigns, um, and that would um, keep the money separate from them, so they can't ideally pocket it and use it on, for their personal expenses, but they can use it to um, you know, run ads and, and, and run their campaign and things like that. All right, so campaign money. And that's a big issue with uh, lobbying, which we'll, we'll talk about later uh, in the course. So political speech, uh, campaign money. Uh, they also uh, have applied it to uh, pornography as a form of expression, art, or speech. So uh, that one cannot necessarily be banned. Although um, there is a limitation on um, obscenity, obscenity rather. So that, that basically means you can't just, if you like have uh, a work of art, whether it's a, a movie or a picture or whatever that might be considered pornographic, you can't just you know, run around displaying it to everybody. Uh, there are some standards on how to um, uh, go about distributing or viewing or selling or whatever uh, that particular uh, good. So again, um, that doesn't mean that because these things are protected in all contexts, they are protected, but in certain contexts, they are. All right, and um, that's probably good enough list. Oh, uh, freedom of speech in schools uh, is protected uh, by teachers uh, and staff and students as well. All right, uh, some limits though, uh, and these are broad, these aren't all of them by the way, just some examples to kind of give you an idea of what they mean by speech and how it's not clear what is or isn't protected. Um, here are some, um, oh wait, I wanna include one more protection and this is a specific one for the press. Oh, well, not just the press, but any writers. Uh, this protects you against protection against prior constraint. You're like, what the hell is that? Prior constraint, oh, there's freedom of speech for you right there. Uh, prior constraint is the idea that the government, specifically, cannot censor you before you publish something. So it might make sense like, oh, the government can't punish me for writing something and distributing it. Uh, but also, this is a little more nefarious, uh, they can't, nefarious on the government's part, they tried to do this, they can't come in before you publish something, read it, and then, and then uh, uh, edit it away or prevent it from being published. That's also a form of, of infringing on freedom of speech. So uh, they can't come in and just uh, not allow you to publish. They have to let you put it out, whatever the, the word might be. Uh, now, again, if uh, it's more complicated, if you're if you're saying things that are um, specifically uh, 
limited that we'll talk about here in a second but uh, that's the idea of prior constraint uh, no pre publication or pre uh, uh, distribution censorship uh, and that's an important one too okay uh, but some limits we do have some limits that have been uh, determined by court decisions across time. Uh, most of them are pretty reasonable, I think you would agree. Uh, one limitation is you cannot use violent, uh, violent, you cannot use speech that incites uh, violence. So no inciting violence. And that's even a little more specific than you think. We're talking immediate. Um, if you say, oh, we have this political program and we really want these changes and we're even uh, willing to use violence to achieve that, that would not be considered inciting violence because it's, it's like a future thing, it's vague. Uh, however, it's, if it's an immediate threat to violence, like get out of our way or we're gonna you know, uh, kill you or, or, or destroy your cars or whatever, whatever it is that you know, they threat, something immediate, that would definitely count as inciting uh, violence. So that, that one can't be, uh, that one's not protected. Uh, you could be criminally or, or you could uh, be subject to criminal charges for that. Um, there is um, no, how is it phrased, not disturbing the peace, no, I don't want to say disturbing the peace, no, you can't say things that incite disorder, um, so no inciting uh, disorder uh, or disturbing the peace. So what I mean by that is you can't say things that, well, first of all, aren't true. So if they're a falsehood, that you're more prob uh, likely to have this attached to you. But you can't say things that would endanger others, uh, especially things that are uh, misleading. So if they're legitimate, like if you're, the, the common example is you can't yell fire in a theater if there's no fire. Uh, if there is a fire, you are essentially protected because you're trying to alert other people to, so they can escape. But if there is no fire and you lie about it and you throw it out there, it's going to uh, uh, cause people to, um, be exposed to unnecessary harm. Like they might trample or get hurt, uh, trample others and get killed or hurt trying to escape uh, and things like that, or cause damage to the building, trying to get out when there's actually no fire. So things like that uh, can't be, uh, are not protected under this First Amendment. Another one, um, uh, fighting words are banned. Then we're fighting words are not protected. So anything specifically uh, used to incite or ca cause violence in somebody else. And I don't mean like a threat. I mean like if you are intentionally insulting somebody in an attempt to get them to uh, uh, use violence, that would not be protected. Uh, so, uh, and that's gonna be contextual. Uh, it might be even hard to prove based on witnesses uh, or, or video footage, but um, that would not be something that is protected. If you're intentionally insulting somebody, and not that you can't necessarily insult people, but if you're doing it with the intent to cause that person to react violently uh, or in, in some other form of legal behavior, uh, that would not be protected. Um, like I mentioned before, there are some, uh, uh, some limitations on speech that we considered obscene because there are contexts for when things are appropriate. Um, so for example, uh, uh, there's child pornography is banned completely. That, even though pornography might be okay in certain circumstances, child pornography is not. That's considered obscene, a violation of uh, the rights of minors and all of that. Uh, but even the pornography issue, that one could be, um, uh, you, you can't just go around, I can't remember the way it's worded according to the uh, court case that dealt with it. It's something along the lines of, if it's violating the standards of, of, the, uh, uh, of the community, the, of the, the common community, then uh, you can't just throw things that might be considered obscene out there. There's got to be some sort of discretion uh, or provision that prevents anyone from seeing it and, and from exposing it to everybody, right? So that's why things like pornography are legal, uh, but you know, you have to be 18 and uh, you have all these hoops to jump through uh, because otherwise people could just go run around uh, uh, and violating uh, social norms uh, against the will of others by just you know, uh, spreading it wherever they wanted to. So there are some limits there as well. And then, uh, not that this is everything, but another major one, and, and the last one we'll talk about is uh, anything that is uh, considered, well, actually it's kind of a combo here, anything that's considered uh, libel uh, or slander. So that is something that is intentionally a lie, it's a falsehood, something that's false, and you're using it to try to destroy somebody's reputation, right, a person or a business. 
So if you're um, going and saying, oh, this restaurant's uh, uh, meat is made from uh, uh, rats or something like that, and it's not true, uh, you could be, um, you would not be protected by the First Amendment there, uh, and that company could uh, sue you for that uh, through a, in a civil case. All right, so that's another one. But also, if we're talking about uh, legal issues like that, uh, you also uh, cannot, you're not protected under free speech for um, plagiarizing, essentially. Uh, so if you are using copyrighted material as your own, that would be not protected by the First Amendment. So I can basically say it's copyright. All right, that's about all I want to say about the First Amendment, but it is much more complex uh, than you might think. You basically can't um, intentionally lie for any reason. Um, you can't potentially uh, try to incite violence or disorder uh, or uh, things that would upset the, uh, uh, the, the community's norms, uh, and you can't uh, lie uh, or use other people's uh, intellectual property uh, or lie to uh, damage their reputation. Uh, those are the, the, the basic limits. That gives you a good idea of what you can and can't do uh, and what they actually protect. So that's the longest one we'll talk about, I think. So uh, let's move on to uh, Amendment 2. Amendment two, a bit simpler, especially number three is simpler. Amendment two, this one has to deal with the uh, uh, right to bear arms. So second, I don't know where it's second amendment. Uh, this one's controversial, especially politically between uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans now. I don't know what it'll be in years, years from now because they tend to flip flop uh, on certain issues. But second amendment uh, has to deal with the uh, right uh, to their arms, uh, which of course is interpreted as uh, weapons, particularly firearms. So the way this one has gone down is, well, first of all, it was pulled specifically uh, by Madison from the English Bill of Rights. Uh, and again, in the Bill of Rights, it was uh, specific to Protestants, but they wanted to prevent the government from intentionally disarming people uh, so that the government could potentially persecute them, right? So that was the intent of it, um, intended or I should say influenced by, drawn from, from the logic of the English Bill of Rights. Uh, and over time, how the Supreme Court has interpreted this has changed. Um, for a while, it was interpreted as military purposes only. So this was like um, essentially the right to hold a state militia. It didn't necessarily guarantee private gun ownership um, for non-military purposes. However, that's changed recently. Um, there are four major cases on it, but we'll talk about the last two. In 2008 and 2010, uh, Supreme Court decisions uh, ruled that this does include uh, protection for non-military purposes, private use for non-military uses uh, slash private use. And this protection applies, by the way, this is the 2010 decision, uh, applies to not only the national government, the federal government, uh, but also the state and local government. So a, a government, whether state, local, or federal, cannot take away your right to responsibly own a gun or uh, potentially other form of arms. Uh, there are some limitations on that. That's not an anything goes. That does not mean, and that's what some of these court decisions were specific about, you can only use them for lawful purposes, such as, for example, home defense, uh, potentially hunting in some cases. Uh, those are the some of the lawful uses. That doesn't mean, however, and they're specific about this, you can uh, carry a gun in all circumstances, uh, you know, loaded uh, at all times. That is not what they mean. There are limitations, and those are under the discretion uh, of uh, these different uh, branches of government or these different tiers of government. But your right to lawfully hold one for home defense or, or maybe perhaps some other sort of legal um, recreational use. That one is uh, uh, currently, as of 2008-2010, uh, the official interpretation and precedent set by the uh, Supreme Court. But there are limits, though, uh, for legal use uh, with situational uh, limits. Um, so what, what's happened in a lot of states is um, states that are a bit more anti-gun have made it more difficult to obtain guns. It doesn't mean that you know you can't get one, but they'll make the process more expensive and arduous. So they're trying to add layers of complexity or, or roadblocks to uh, disincentivize you from wanting, from like, oh, I don't want to bother. It's too much money or it takes too long or, or whatever it might be. Um, but uh, do keep in mind, this doesn't mean that 
everyone has a right to a gun in all contexts, uh, in all situations, at all times. Uh, for example, uh, fel uh, convicted felons uh, usually can't own guns. I don't know every detail of it, but for the most part, they cannot uh, legally obtain a gun. Um, and, and you do have to legally obtain guns. You can't just, you know, um, depending on the state uh, and, the, and the area, there's different qualifications on uh, how you acquire one, uh, if it's registered and, and, all, and how it's registered and all those details. But uh, your right to actually have one for private use, private legal use, that is protected uh, as according to the courts in 2008, 2010. All right, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, gun experts and guns rights experts that have way more information on that and a Google search could easily find that and get some of the details that I was uncertain of or maybe foggy on, but uh, that's the general, that's the gist of it, the, uh, the uh, basic idea. All right, third amendment, this one's super easy. Uh, this one's going to make it uh, illegal for uh, uh, quartering of soldiers in uh, private homes. Uh, that goes back, uh, well, actually goes back to even the, the English Bill of Rights and, and earlier, earlier um, uh, English laws, but that one's largely because of the disdain colonists had under Great Britain uh, for um, the quartering of soldiers uh, during and specifically after the Seven Years' War when they were trying to extract uh, taxes uh, from the colonists. So they don't want to have to uh, uh, feed and house soldiers against their will. That's a violation of their rights. So they included that. And that one's not controversial. I don't think it's been a part of any major social Supreme Court decision or anything like that. Uh, that one's pretty clear cut. Nobody's really had a problem with that um, or an issue with it. All right, um, the Fourth Amendment. See, I told you this would be faster than the first. Fourth Amendment, this one's a little more complex. This one uh, has to deal with basically how the government can uh, seize your property or arrest you. Uh, it's it's not it's not arbitrary. We're specifically talking about property here and, and searches. Uh, so this uh, protects your um, uh, right to require a lawful search and seizure seizure by the law. It has to have probable cause, uh, and depending on the situation, it's got to have a, a warrant issued uh, uh, from a judge or, or other court official. So um, so Fourth Amendment. The, this is going to be about uh, searches and seizures. Spell. Uh, and this one's going to be uh, attached to, and so for them to, for the, uh, for law enforcement to come into your home and search or take your property, uh, they can't just do it arbitrarily or on a hunch or when they that. They have to have probable cause and a specific warrant that is based on this probable cause uh, from a judge or other other official. So, uh, and also requires a requires. Probable cause uh, with a uh, specific warrant based on that probable cause. Uh, that is what is required. So they can't just show up and search your house and take your stuff. Uh, they have to have that probable cause and that warrant. Um, and they can't even um, do that potentially uh, to your car. Um, you, you can't actually uh, cite the Fourth Amendment and then, of course, Depending on the situation, they might just make you wait and get the warrant. But uh, nonetheless, that is uh, part of the Fourth Amendment. And the reason why they're doing this is they're trying to prevent, uh, particularly the executive branch, uh, through the police or military, from uh, violating your rights by just going in and seizing your stuff and taking it and finding evidence on you that was not obtained uh, legally. Uh, and in fact, if they don't adhere to these standards and they find stuff that does incriminate you, that could help make you uh, help them find you guilty of a crime, they can't use it. It'll be thrown out because it wasn't obtained uh, lawfully. They violate your rights by not having probable cause and a search warrant and, and, and taking it and acquiring it that way. Uh, so that's an important one. And that was also based on, again, not only uh, to uh, uh, added to prevent uh, or protect individual rights, obviously, but also they uh, did not like these general warrants that were used uh, by the British and during the American Revolution that were just like a, a general warrant to go in and search whatever they want, wanted for, for whatever purpose they wanted. They wanted probable cause uh, and that permission from a, from a, a, a court official or a, just, or a judge. All right, which uh, brings me and, to uh, and to prevent general warrants. So it's specific. All right, uh, Fifth Amendment.
This one uh, has quite a few things added to it, uh, but they're, they're, they're some fairly uh, uh, commonly, they're, they're commonly woven as far as theme goes. Uh, they're all legal issues for the most part. So um, one of them is um, what we call now eminent domain. This is where, this is definitely an economic right that they're protecting, uh, as well as the next one, due process. I'll do all them together here, due process. So this one's not as, as much a legal issue. I mean, it is a legal issue, but this one doesn't have to do with, because if you're using something illegally like a house or, or a car for an illegal activity, like, I don't know, you're making some sort of uh, illegal narcotic or, I don't know, whatever, it is, whatever illegal activity you're doing, the government can, uh, uh, if they, you know, obtain the warrant, search and seize, and they find that it was being used for that, they can just uh, take your, your property they were using uh, for, that, for that crime. However, uh, the government can also take your property for um, non-crimes. So you're like, what are you talking about? For example, this is what we, what we call, refer to eminent domain as an example of it. When they're building a highway and it's gotta be, you know, go this direction or go straight or go through this hill, whatever. Um, most of the time, some sort of private property is in the way, whether it's land or a house or a store or parking lot, whatever it might be, somebody owns that property. So to prevent them from, uh, prevent the government from just walking all over the rights of its citizens and destroying their property or taking it um, you know, arbitrarily, they require, and this is what the eminent domain clause is um, in the uh, Fifth Amendment, they're required to compensate you for that. So they're supposed to give you a fair price for the, for the property they take. Um, so again, if they need to uh, use the land that your house is on for a new road or highway that's necessary or for whatever, or for whatever government project, uh, they can uh, take your property but they have to pay you for it and they have to give you a fair price. So they're gonna base that, of course, on um, real estate prices for that size and in that area, et cetera, and they'll give you that. Uh, they can't necessarily screw you over by not paying you or, or, or lowballing you or, or whatever. All right, so that's eminent domain. Uh, but the due process thing is also uh, an economic right that's protected. Uh, due process is they can't take your life, liberty, or property without um, going through the legal, necessary legal steps. They're gonna to have to have probable cause. You're gonna to have to go through the uh, trial process. So both the, uh, the having to compensate you as well as this due process thing, these are both gonna be protections of um, your economic right. The eminent domain, of course, uh, because that it requires the government to pay you uh, fairly for the property that they take uh, for, their, for their necessary project, whatever it might be. And the due process is essentially guaranteeing you um, a, a, the right to a trial. So first of all, they have to have probable cause uh, to even uh, try to indict you, and then we'll talk about the grand jury process too. But uh, this due process means you've got to get that fair trial uh, based on evidence, and they've got to find you guilty uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Completely clear to the jury that you are guilty of this, uh, of this crime. Uh, if there's any reasonable doubt that you might not have done it, that you might be innocent, then they're not supposed to find you guilty. Uh, and that's what that one is intended uh, actually to call up. Uh, to protect you against. The Fifth Amendment is also going to, uh, in the case of a criminal trial, which is again where, where the government is finding you guilty of violating some uh, public law, uh, and they're the ones that are prosecuting you, uh, bringing charges against you, and uh, trying to find you guilty of this crime they think you committed, um, that's going to require a grand jury, jury required for criminal indictment. That's a lot of legal terms, and uh, I'm not a legal uh, uh, expert by any means, but I have a basic idea what this means. So um, what they mean by grand jury is, uh, first of all, it's gonna be larger than what's called a petite jury. The trial jury, you get the people that decide if you're guilty or not. This is like a jury of regular citizens, uh, uh, non-biased ones, ideally. They're the ones that get together and determine if there's enough evidence to indict or try uh, a, somebody for criminal charges. So that's gonna require regular people to assess the situation and determine if they're going to pursue criminal charges or not, uh, rather than just, you know, some arbitrary member of the government. So that's actually a, an excellent set of protections that um, could and do protect you from government officials uh, uh, going after you uh, on their own uh, to try to indict you uh, or convict you of a, of a crime. Uh, and then the other jury, the trial jury, is the one that's formed to determine if you are guilty or not of the crime. Uh, and then, of course, they're going to have to look at the evidence and all that. This is the one determining if you 
are going to have charges brought against you based on evidence they might have through probable cause, whether it's you know through search warrants or other evidence that's put together, uh, they'll determine if you're going to have the trial or not. Um, and the last part of the, uh, for, for the Fifth Amendment is the uh, clause that um, protects you against uh, self-incrimination, against testifying against yourself, uh, protects against self-incrimination. So if you've ever heard, uh, heard the, uh, they're, they're called Miranda rights after the 1966 or 67 uh, case, uh, where they had to throw out evidence because this, this guy wasn't aware of his uh, rights to a, a lawyer, which is uh, in the next uh, amendment, as well as his uh, right to remain silent. Uh, you're, not, you're never compelled to uh, testify against yourself. So if they arrest you and start asking you questions, um, you don't have to answer them uh, until uh, you are being, um, you've had your charges presented to you, uh, and you've had uh, access to uh, counsel, a, a lawyer. Uh, that is uh, what is required. So when, uh, whenever people have the right to remain silent or they reference it, they're talking about the Fifth Amendment, or I plead the Fifth, uh, that's what they're talking about. You're not compelled to or forced to uh, say things that might hurt your case or incriminate you on accident. And that's what they're, they're fearing. They're not as concerned about, you know, keeping criminals who are actually guilty of the crime um, out of prison. They're concerned about uh, alleged criminals that are not guilty, that might accidentally say something that uh, makes them uh, seem more likely to be uh, guilty of the crime or maybe uh, unintentionally does uh, make them guilty of the crime. So that's what that one's there to protect. I forgot to mention an important one for the Fifth Amendment, uh, the protection for, from double jeopardy. Double jeopardy meaning like you're jeopardizing your, your life and limb uh, twice. So that means basically you can't be tried for a crime twice, the same crime. Even if they have new evidence against you, once you are found specifically innocent of something, uh, they can't uh, reinitiate another uh, trial for the same crime. Once that uh, verdict is reached uh, and you're found innocent, for example, uh, you cannot be tried for that same crime again. That's an important one. Uh, one famous example is the uh, O.J. Simpson case where he was uh, found not guilty uh, of, uh, of murder. And um, even though some uh, their evidence had, had surfaced or other people felt otherwise about the case, uh, and he made some comments later uh, about what he would have done and, and all of that, uh, none of that could be used against him. He's protected uh, by the Fifth Amendment from being tried for that crime. Again, even if he um, had, even if the prosecution found some other evidence to uh, bring to the table that made it almost certain that they were guilty, they were already tried and found not guilty. It can't happen again. The Sixth Amendment. Sixth Amendment is uh, also closely tied to your uh, legal rights, uh, specifically with the judicial branch. So Sixth Amendment, apparently I'm using numbers now instead of writing the word. Sixth Amendment provides several protections. Uh, it guarantees you a uh, right to a speedy trial and that that trial is carried out by a jury of your peers. Uh, so that is non-government members that are supposed to be impartial. So we supposed to be people that don't know you, anything about you, uh, and they're just looking at the evidence as presented by uh, the defendant's lawyers, the person that's trying not to be put into prison or, or uh, found guilty, uh, and the prosecuting attorneys, the people that are trying to uh, successfully pin this uh, uh, guilty or uh, uh, verdict on you. Uh, they're supposed to be uh, regular people. So like the grand jury, is regular people uh, from the population um, deciding if you are going to be uh, charged. And then the next uh, set of jury that we're talking about here is uh, regular people that are going to um, uh, uh, decide if you're guilty or not based on the evidence presented. All right, and the speedy trial is actually quite important because uh, this had been used uh, by monarchs in the past to uh, say, oh, you'll have your right to a trial, but <clears throat> they just hold them indefinitely in prison uh, before their tri trial. So like. You, uh, if you're arrested, you might be held, held in jail uh, temporarily um, until your trial time. You, in most cases, have um, the opportunity for bail, which is where you pay a, a sum of money. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they hold that. And if you try to escape or violate that uh, bail, those bail conditions, then the, the government's up keeping it. Um, but uh, that's supposed to be temporary until you have the trial. That's where you get the guilty or innocent verdict, and that's where you would, if guilty, actually go to prison, uh, and you're gonna stay there until your sentence is up, uh, whether you get out early or have to stay later because of other things you do inside prison or whatever. 
Um, but that's what the speedy trial is, because what they used to do, or they had done in the past, it was if someone didn't like you, they could uh, put you in jail and, and set your trial date uh, to some really distant uh, time, or not set the date at all, but say it's gonna happen, and just keep you there in jail uh, without bail, or with a bail that's way too high that you can't pay, uh, and you essentially brought in prison uh, without having, getting, getting to the trial, or you get it years later, or something ridiculous. This means you get one as quickly as possible, and uh, you, of course, get a right to a, a jury. We'll talk about the, 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 the bail fines. They're gonna, in the Eighth Amendment, basically, they just say no excessive uh, bails or fines can be set, but uh, the interpretation of excessive is, is relative uh, to the person's amount of money and the situation, the state, and the time, and all those things. All right, um, speedy trial by jury. Oh, you also have a right to a counsel, which is basically a lawyer, legal advice. Uh, and in fact, uh, now the state's uh, required to provide you with one um, if uh, you can't afford your own or have your own. Uh, right to a counsel, which is basically a lawyer. So you're not on your own. You're not, we don't all know the, the legal system. In fact, very few of us do. Uh, so you're not expected to be able to go give yourself a legal defense because you will almost certainly fail because you don't know the procedures and, 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 and details. All right. Uh, you also have a right to confront uh, witnesses against you. So hear their case and, and answer, uh, provide a response, uh, as well as uh, compel witnesses of your own to uh, testify uh, on behalf of your uh, defense. Okay, and um, I feel like I'm forgetting one. Counsel, no, that's them. That's the ones I wanted to talk about. Uh, so that's what's important. Your right to a lawyer, uh, your right to a speedy trial, trial by jury, and then uh, the uh, being able to engage your answer to uh, your witnesses and, and compel witnesses on your behalf. So those are the uh, the basic ones, and this is also including the Miranda rights, um, that you uh, have the right to remain silent and the right to a lawyer. Uh, they have to tell you that off the bat, uh, otherwise uh, nothing they can say, nothing you say can be uh, used against you uh, in court of law. So that's the uh, Sixth Amendment. Seventh Amendment. This one um, is a protection specifically in civil cases. So let me quickly tell you the difference after I write out what it is. This one uh, guarantees you the uh, right to trial by jury in federal cases, so only ones that have to do with the national government, uh, over $20. Oh, I should say civil cases. In federal civil cases, cases over $20. Nowadays, I think that's like almost $600, it's like 580 something, 600 today. Because you mind that was written in 1788, or 87, uh, no, 88. And, um, and potentially 89, depending on how it was changed. Um, but that's, uh, that's a lot more money now than, than it was back then. So now it's like $600-ish. Um, and then a, a, a judge cannot overturn uh, a jury's decision that's based on fact, cannot overturn. All right, so that probably didn't help out most of you, unless you know the difference between a civil case and a criminal case. So civil case, criminal case. The civil case is an issue between two people or two uh, organizations or a person and organization. Uh, this is where the government's not involved. They're not the ones uh, prosecuting you, uh, trying to find you guilty of a crime, uh, of, a, of a public crime uh, and, and, and pursue you that way. So a criminal case, that is the government, whether it's state or federal, whatever. Government uh, is prosecuting you, individual or uh, organization, for breaking of uh, public laws. So things like um, um, committed against or in the public, for example, um, would be you know murder, uh, robbery, um, rape, things like that. Um, any of the crimes of that nature, those would be criminal. Oh, another uh, example could be like drunk driving, um, possession of uh, certain or s s possession use or distribution of certain drugs. Right, and we can always argue about what should and shouldn't be banned, but uh, when it is the law, the criminal case would apply. Uh, that's a criminal case. So the government's actually going after you uh, and trying to find you guilty of, um, you know, some sort of criminal offense like robbery, rape, murder, 
uh, kidnapping, um, drug sale, distribution, etc. Those sorts of topics. Civil cases, I have a legal issue with another person, um, or I've got a legal issue with a, an organization, or that organization uh, has one with me or another organization. So it's dealing with not the government prosecuting me, it's individuals or organizations in some combination trying to uh, uh, usually sue uh, legally. So these are uh, people or organization versus people or organization. Uh, and these have to do with uh, non-criminal charges. So these would be like legal issues, like um, <clears throat> if there's a dispute over like a property line, like this contract says the property line's here, but this contract says it's here. Uh, the enforcement of contracts. Um, if you try to sue somebody uh, for tort or injury, uh, that would be a civil case. Um, another civil case, divorces, those are civil cases. Uh, one's dealing with, with child support uh, uh, or um, um, visitation rights. Those are all just some examples of uh, civil cases. So um, let's see, this would be like uh, legal issues such as um, divorce, property uh, disputes, Copyright uh, issues. Uh, what are some of those I already mentioned? I mentioned a bunch. I'm forgetting them. Divorce, uh, child support, or rights. Those are all going to be examples of that. Oh, uh, tort, this would be injury. So if you're suing for damages, medical expenses, whatever it might be, uh, those would all be examples of that. Oh, uh, uh, for libel or slander. Like so they're lying to destroy you or your company's reputation. Uh, that's that's where you would pursue in a civil case. And usually you're looking for money in those uh, situations. However, depending on the crime, you could be convicted uh, or tried for a criminal and civil charge, or tried for criminal or civil charge. So here's an example. Let's say a drunk driver um, crashes into and kills or hurts somebody. They're gonna be tried because they were drunk driving. That's a criminal case. The state's gonna prosecute them for the drunk driving. Um, so, you know, if the person died, for example, uh, they could be found of uh, murder with his first or whatever degree it might be. They could be uh, found guilty of murder. That's a criminal case. However, they could have another set of cases with the exact same issue where um, the uh, um, uh, civil, um, uh, the victims in that crime, that family, that individual, uh, who got injured or had the death or whatever, had their property damage, they could also uh, have a civil case where they're trying to sue for compensation uh, for those damages. So that's an important one uh, to mention uh, as far as a distinction to make. So this just basically means that, um, and this, by the way, does not apply to states or local governments, it's only for federal cases, that uh, you have the right to a jury and the uh, judge cannot overrule that. Um, that's what that one is referring to. Eighth Amendment. This one has to do with um, um, the government cannot apply excessive fines, uh, bail, or cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, what that one means is uh, this one's a bit more uh, subjective. Uh, what is excessive uh, fine or bail? What does that What does that mean? What number would that be? That's going to be uh, up to the discretion of the, uh, the, the the court or the jury at the time, uh, well, the justice specifically or the judge. But that that could be dependent on your personal income or you at the time or area you're in. There's all kinds of factors that would uh, be considered excessive there. Uh, so that one's on a case to case basis uh, and changes. But the cruel and unusual punishment that one can actually be uh, that one's a controversial one as well because being like the 60s and 70s, uh, some uh, justices and judges and others have begun to claim that the cruel and unusual punishment that would apply to the death penalty or capital punishment. Uh, they uh, argue that, hey, in our changing definitions over time, uh, does the death penalty constitute cruel and unusual punishment? Uh, and some, in some cases, the uh, prison conditions are so poor, whether they are extremely hot or extremely cold or uh, they're not getting medical attention uh, or they are um, mistreated um, by the guards or they're getting too much solitary confinement or not enough time out in the yard, whatever it might be, uh, 
there have been some instances where the prison conditions are so bad that it's actually considered, uh, or at least possibly considered, a form of uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, so those are uh, six through eight, and uh, we got just two more to go, nine and ten, and those are uh, a little bit more simple uh, than the six and seven anyway. The final two are going to be the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth. We'll do the Ninth first, obviously. Uh, this amendment is an important one, um, at least the Anti-Federalists, because this is the one that's going to guarantee protections um, that extend beyond just those that are listed in the Constitution. It's saying basically the rights citizens and states have, well, citizens specifically, individuals have, are more than just the ones listed in the, in the Constitution. And they did that just in case they, uh, a new right emerged in the future um, or they had neglected to specifically mention one or protect one. And that would mean, oh, it's not protected. The government can just take it uh, and, and, and use it. So the Ninth Amendment basically guarantees uh, or states that uh, rights are not limited solely uh, to those listed in the Constitution. Uh, so you might wonder, well, what, what does that mean? What rights do we not include? Uh, here's an example of one. Uh, one that was not listed, uh, or even implied necessarily, has been granted or recognized by the Supreme Court to citizens, and that's the right to privacy. Uh, right to privacy is an example one. And they made uh, rulings on this in a series of, I don't remember the years for all of them. I think it was like 1947. Was it 47? Well, I don't know the years exactly. I believe it was the 40s, and then it was the Roe v. Wade in the 70s, and then in the 90s they had another, uh, another decision regarding privacy. Uh, so first, they uh, granted the right, uh, there was a law that banned the use of contraceptions. Um, I don't remember what state it was. Was it Pennsylvania? No, it wasn't Pennsylvania. I can't remember what state it was. One of the states banned the use of contraceptions and the uh, Supreme Court decided, ruled that unconstitutional uh, because, it's, because it voids or um, um, violates the privacy of um, people that may want to use them, for specific, specifically mentioning uh, married couples. So if spouses want to use contraceptions to uh, uh, limit the number of kids they have. That is a right that is uh, guaranteed them and uh, should be privately uh, insured medically uh, and not uh, public information that should be available and, and prosecutable. All right, so that one was uh, referring to uh, contraception use, was the first one. <clears throat> and then Roe v. Wade, uh, the ruling was that state laws that banned abortion were illegal because that would make public the medical information of the, uh, uh, the women uh, in, um, in question uh, for those abortions. So Roe v. Wade, um, uh, how, how do I phrase this one? Uh, medical privacy and that's gonna of course I do with abortion uh, and then uh, on the same grounds like this one in the 90s where they uh, made it illegal to require maybe this one was the Pennsylvania one made it illegal to require um, spousal consent before an abortion uh, because not necessarily because they hated men or something like that, like other people have claimed before, but they wanted to maintain this uh, protection of uh, guarantee of privacy um, uh, medically. Uh, and they're also going to, of course, uh, outlaw, or I should say, um, reject laws that um, uh, require spousal consent or an abortion. And the same uh, uh, logic was used that it would violate their medical privacy, make that a public record, or something they could monitor publicly. All right, cool. Ninth Amendment, that's that one. And Last Amendment, Tenth Amendment, well, not the Last Amendment, the Last Amendment, the Bill of Rights that was uh, uh, ratified at the time, in the 1780s, or 90s. Um, Tenth Amendment. Tenth Amendment, Tenth Amendment. That one is going to be uh, the state's rights. This is, this is the, the state's rights clause. This is what's referred to as the reserved powers clause. Uh, this one says that uh, all powers, not rights that are protected, but all powers, all things that the, the government can do, the national government can do, all powers not uh, given 
to the uh, national government, the federal government, so Congress, President, Supreme Court, uh, in the Constitution are reserved to the states. Uh, so this is part of the federal um, uh, arrangement. So in a federation, so a confederation is states have, or provinces states have a, a, their own basic autonomy, and the, uh, the national or federal government is, is weak or non-existent for the most part. It's kind of a League of Friendship Alliance idea. In a unitary government, the, uh, the, the national government have all the power. It could eliminate uh, or, or subjugate all states and local governments to exactly what they said in all cases. A federation, the idea is supposed to be, it's like a mix. Uh, and in this case, the U.S. Constitution, this, this our form of a federal government federation, it does give more power to the um, national government, but it doesn't give all power to the national government. States still have some rights and powers um, uh, within themselves. Uh, and this specifically says that if it's not given to the federal government or to the national government, then the states by default have that power. Uh, so you're like, well, what does that even mean? Oh, uh, well, obviously, taxing rights, military, treaties, things like that uh, are designated to the national government. And if there's any conflict uh, between the two, then uh, you, it defers to the national government. But things that are the Constitution that have been managed by states are examples like public education, not in the Constitution at all. So that is a state-to-state -state issue. Uh, initially, slavery was, because that's not mentioned in the Constitution, or at least not granted to uh, the, uh, the, the national government, uh, I should say was. Of course, they're very understandably and reasonable, uh, realistically uh, going to realize later that slavery is a blatant violation of human rights. And uh, of course, it should be banned um, in all states because uh, it does violate uh, pretty much every single uh, right you have in the Bill of Rights. Um, um, another example might be, I'm blanking on other examples. Hmm. So public education, slavery, what's another state? Oh, um, uh, this was an issue before, uh, requiring a specific drinking age that was an issue before because it wasn't mentioned in there uh, or alluded to, although there is a federal law on it uh, for, for a legal uh, minimum legal drinking age. Um, they have, the national government has found ways to get around this 10th Amendment though on some occasions. Uh, the first way they do this is, um, so let's say there's, there's, there's no regulations on uh, the use of, of narcotics. There's, there's no mention of drugs by any capacity in the um, uh, Congress or in the uh, Constitution. So um, the way that uh, the government found the authority constitutionally to make laws ban banning certain substances uh, was with the Commerce Clause uh, given to the federal government on regulating commerce uh, between borders. So long as uh, it's an industry that goes between state borders or goes across uh, national borders, Congress and the national government have the authority on that. So sometimes they use that as a way to um, uh, regulate or maintain laws legally uh, over the states, even though it's not mentioned in the Constitution, and they can do have a drinking age. And if states don't comply with these uh, uh, regulations or, or, or other ones that the federal government wants to or claims to have at the states, if they don't, uh, one way they can sort of punish the states legally is by um, uh, denying so actually, I should give us a category. Uh, ways the national government circumvents or goes around, avoids, uh, uh, finds a loophole for. They uh, uh, cite the Commerce Clause. Again, if anything that's going between state or national borders, that's an industry that they can uh, approve or does have, uh, you know, takes place across borders. They can have some authority on it legally. Uh, and they can also, uh, if there's a, a state that's dissident or, or opposing them or not adhering to a certain policy uh, or, or you know, arguing with this co uh, commerce clause, uh, they can uh, deny them, uh, deny states federal funding. So for example, a common one uh, to pull, um, the money that states receive uh, from the federal government is for uh, universities. Um, and education. So if a state government is not adhering to a federal policy, uh, the federal government uh, can 
uh, legally in some cases, in most cases, uh, cut the funding to that state. Uh, and that kind of forces the state to uh, either deal without the uh, massive amount of federal money coming in uh, for that program, or they have to, of course, comply with the, the federal government's request. So that's been kind of a way that, two ways that the federal government, the national government's kind of um, circumvented or avoided this, this 10th amendment. But nonetheless, it is stated in the amendments that it's not given to the, cost, the, uh, the national government, it uh, is reserved for the states. And that, again, those are known as reserved powers, which we'll get to uh, uh, next week when we talk about specific powers. Uh, reserve meaning states get it because it wasn't mentioned in the Constitution, but ones that are given to the, the, the national government are um, expressed powers because they're written right in there, or implied powers because they help them carry those out. Um, and then the, uh, the fourth type power is called a concurrent power. It's one that's held by both, uh, like taxation, for example. All right, those are all the amendments, and uh, next week we'll start talking about the various, uh, the first three articles and the branches of government.